Today's episode was brought to you by our sponsor, Thompson Rogers Lawyers, and features a one-on-one -on -one discussion that focuses on accommodating a concussion in the classroom. This episode was facilitated by Ryan Sutton, the executive director of the Heads Up Concussion Advocacy Network and a passionate leader in the concussion space. Welcome to the final episode of our second season of the Sharing Experiences with Concussion and Traumatic Brain Injury podcast. On this episode, we'll be exploring the topic of accommodating a concussion in the classroom. My name is Ryan Sutton, and I'm the Executive Director of the Heads Up Concussion Advocacy Network, who's a nonprofit organization whose mission is to build collaborative networks in an effort to innovate and inspire concussion education, awareness, and research. I'm very excited today to facilitate a one-on-one -on -one podcast episode that will be answering the most pressing questions for teachers supporting students with a concussion. For teachers and students alike, navigating the through these circumstances can be quite difficult for many different reasons, often individualized to each situation. Today, I'll be speaking with one of the leading experts in the field of pediatric concussion who works with students every day to build strategies for their recovery. I'm pleased to welcome our expert guest, Stephanie McFarland from the Hall and Blur View Concussion Center. Welcome, Stephanie. Hey, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we really appreciate having you here. Um, if you could just briefly introduce yourself, the work you do, and sure. uh, yeah, just let people know um, kind of your background. Sure, sounds good. Um, well, you obviously already did a great introduction, but I guess some pieces I'll add is I'm a clinician by background. I'm an occupational therapist who's been working in concussion center at home, where they want to say for I guess seven years now. Um, working clinically, as you said, with kids in their recovery, but then also have sort of a leadership role and project management role um, where I work at a broader scale outside the hospital. So working with broader communities, whether it's the medical community, the sports community, the school community, parents, kids, just on understanding the ever-changing best practices that are happening in concussion and what we'll talk about at length today is that over the past three to five years, there's been a ton of change in what we do in pediatric concussion. And I think it's really important to get that message out. So outside of doing that within our four walls at home, Blairview, we want to make sure that that's understood across the broader community. So looking forward to talking more about that today and maybe what we used to do, we don't do anymore. And why is that? So uh, yeah, looking forward to diving into that more. Yeah, I'm really excited to explore that with you as well. And yeah, I think you're the perfect person for this podcast and uh, really excited to get into those conversations on some of the more finer details of uh, the situation. But before we get into the discussion, I'd like to provide some context for this episode that may be helpful for the viewers. Um, basically, when we're putting this podcast together, uh, we reached out to teachers across Ontario to see if they had any questions or experiences with navigating through accommodating a student with a concussion that they'd like to share with us. Um, so I'd like to extend a big thank you to all the teachers who submitted questions and shared their experiences. Your submissions were well received and will provide the foundation that this podcast was built upon. Um, so you'll see some questions throughout that were, were actually created um, in collaboration with these questions that were uh, proposed by the teachers, and we'll be sharing some direct questions and some direct experiences from those teachers as well. And one last thing before we jump into the discussion, I think it's important for our listeners to understand that this podcast series is only going to be focusing on the concussion experience. The insights shared throughout this episode should not be taken into consideration when dealing with students or a person with moderate to severe brain injury. And I think with that, Stephanie, I think we'll get right into it uh, with our first question here. Um, so before we get into the more detailed areas, um, I'd like to kind of get an overview of what the general return to school standards are. If you could please provide that, that would be amazing. Yeah, I think this will be a, a good time to highlight maybe some of the things have changed or what we've learned over the past few years is what we should be doing with return to school moving forward. Um, and the first one is honestly just a more 
active approach with return to activities that are low risk in nature. And what we mean by low risk is activities that don't pose risk of sustaining another concussion or are highly unlikely to do so. So when we think about cognitive activities, social activities, light aerobic exercise, it's more individual in nature. These are the things we want kids doing sooner rather than later. Um, and not always doing it on a very rigid, symptom-free expectation. Um, so what I mean by that is it's okay for kids when they're starting to do some cognitive activity, when they're starting to do red aerobic exercise, engaging in social activities, to have some symptoms when they start. And what's important is to sort of gauge how much within that tolerance we should work with until we take a break and how much is okay to continue with. Because what we're learning is engagement and stimulation of the brain helps it recover. Um, and if we continually rest every single time, we may actually be creating more problems and prolonging recovery by doing that. So there's been a ton of really good research out there where it's pretty much the gold standard now. And everyone agrees that exercise is medicine when it comes to concussions. So the sooner you're exercising, whether it's a stationary bike, walking, going for a light jog, likely the better you will do. And there's many reasons for that. It's um, going to help with your symptoms, but it's also going to help with some of those secondary factors like help your sleep, help your mood, um, help your overall well-being. So exercise is really important. What's starting to evolve in the research a bit more is we can also kind of apply that to cognitive activities. So the sooner we stimulate the brain, um, obviously not overburning it with too much stress and workload, which we'll talk about further in the podcast, but doing something, um, the better you're going to do. So I still feel like that's not completely understood, or we still expect kids, for example, to be completely symptom-free before they return to school or completely symptom-free with cognitive activities at home before they would start something more, or they need to be completely symptom-free before they write a test. Um, and we'll get into the details today, I'm sure, but you know, those are some myths that we're trying to get out there to say that's not true. Um, let's participate, accommodate, and prioritize. Like that's sort of the three main things that we tend to, to focus on to get kids back. Um, so in light of that, I guess one more thing I'll add in terms of what's changing over the past bit is we're starting to think of return to school a little bit more of a guideline rather than a very rigid protocol. Um, rigid protocols are important when we're doing more risky activities. So like return to sport or return to competition, because those are the things that might create risk for another concussion. Therefore, we do want to make sure people have fully recovered before they engage in those. But school is such an individualized experience. Um, and everyone has their pre-injury challenges. Um, everyone has different learning needs and everyone's in a different situation. Like we can't apply a kid who's in grade two to be having similar school situation to someone who's in grade 12 and about to go to university. There is more um, at stake for missing a lot of school and workload and not doing tests. So I guess the other piece is we're really starting to learn that schools and teachers, they know individualized learning really well. <laughs> they do it amazingly. Well, and sometimes when we throw really strict protocols at them, we kind of take away their skills to do that. Um, so how can we sort of rethink what we do with return to school and just think, you know, these steps and stages are a guideline, but at the end of the day, we should really be looking at the kid, their needs, their circumstances prior to injury, their circumstances now, and just think what's going to work for this kid. Um, so that's, I think, probably the two things, just active approaches and Rethinking just back to individualization um, is really what's changing. And we'll dive into more of the details as we go. Absolutely. No, mm -hmm. I really appreciate all that information. And um, you highlighted something just like the, the individualized approach. And, and when teachers are navigating through that, what are different ways that when they're looking at the guidelines, the protocols, how they can support the, the, the student going through it? Um, when it hasn't necessarily, those guidelines haven't caught up to the protocols. You kind of touched upon it, but if you can just, I guess, dive into that a bit more, that'd be amazing. 
Yeah, the reality, the way the concussion world works, or I guess any world that's changing in evidence very quickly, is I think I think the statistic is correct, but you might want to fact check me after this podcast. But I think on average, it takes about seven years for evidence to be implemented in the best practice. And perhaps at times it's longer than that, I think at minimum. The problem with concussion is that things have changed so quickly over the past three to five years a lot of guidelines and protocols within the schools that were created three to five years ago no longer align with actually what we would recommend as best practices or what's going to help someone recover. Um, And I think what further complicated that is obviously COVID. Like schools, concussion was not a priority for the past like two to three years. Schools are completely overwhelmed with other needs. Now we have schools with a lot more behavioral and mental health challenges. So it's really, really tough for schools and best practice guidelines for many reasons, funding, time, resources to continually keep up as quickly as they would need to. Um, So I think what we need to do is understand that some of the protocols that are in place across school boards or within schools lack some of that language that I just spoke to. So maybe their language is a little bit more rigid in nature and we want to look at it and maybe loosen it a bit in our minds. So do you need to be symptom-free reading for a specific amount of time before you go back and engage in school? No, think of it kind of as a guideline. In general, that would be ideal, but if it's not working for that kid, what we're learning is a kid should really be back in school within a week from recovery. And that doesn't mean fully back. It means exposed to the school environment in some capacity. Um, If we wait for everything to be fine or better or perfect until we get back to school, we may prolong the problem. Um, A lot of kids get really anxious when they um, are out of school for a long time. They think about how much work they're missing. And the longer that occurs, the bigger of a hill it feels like they need to climb to go back. So yes, we could sit and do cognitive activities at home as long as we want, but at some point we do need to try some exposures to the school environment. And that's just kind of an example of, though it may say something in your protocol, kind of look at the kid and understand their circumstance. How how much stress is that causing keeping this kid at home? Does this kid have a good home circumstance? Should we be considering maybe sort of bringing them back sooner than rather than later, even though they still have symptoms and just accommodate and manage their symptoms within the school environment instead? Um, there's a really good resource and I'm actually part of the expert panel. It's called the PEDS concussion living guidelines. I'm sure you can link to it in the podcast notes afterwards, but that really is where best practice stands. There's really good resources there for teachers to pick up. So I know it's kind of annoying to have one thing protocol that may say one thing, but then, um, the guidelines say something else. I think we just need to look at and say, in general, this is what we want things to look like, but we don't need to follow it like a rule book anymore when it comes to return to learn. And I guess the last thing I would say is there's a lot of, I think, heightened rigidity because of Rowan's law. So a lot of people feel that legislation applies is to return to learn, but that's actually not true. Legislation currently applies to return to sport and physical activity within the school environment, which should have a more rigid piece in nature because of what we spoke to earlier. Those are the things that could create risk for another injury. Um, It's not legislated that you need to follow each stage of a return to learn or return to school protocol. That's kind of left up to you know, best judgment of all of those involved with the kid and what they think would work best for them. Every kid has a right to be accommodated for their concussion. I think that that is one thing we all want to commit to and that those accommodations should be fast acting in nature and supported. But those accommodations shouldn't be restrictions or avoidance of activities. They should always lean towards how in some way can this kid participate. I think if we think of it as a general rule of thumb, Maybe we can start to make sense of our our protocols, but it's confusing. It's the reality of where it is, but I think teachers have um, a lot more skill set here than I think we, the teachers know how to do this (laughs) really well. (laughs) So I think when we take away some of that rigidity, that rigid focus, um, kids actually do better. They know these kids way better than the medical community knows them. So I guess that'll be my final piece on those inconsistencies. <laughs> oh, that's great. And mm-hmm. I think 
yeah, the having the teachers kind of utilize their skill set. That's something that I know we've talked about a lot. Yeah. And it, it's so important because they are trained. They, they know the students. They know kind of how they're interacting. They know their circumstances. So being able to help them kind of weed through the guidelines, the protocols is could be very advantageous for a student's recovery. Um, and you may have mentioned at least one of these, but I'd love if you can just kind of debunk some concussion myths um, sure, relevant to the return to learn process. Let's just dive into those myths. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I've touched on a few, but it's helpful just to yeah. like list them and review them. Mm-hmm. So I think the first one is having symptom-free expectations for um, low risk physical or cognitive or social activities. We want to start doing things more as tolerated. Um, So I kind of use a bit of a a color scale with kids and maybe I'll explain it so it can give people some context because sometimes when we say as tolerated, people say, well, what on earth does that mean? So for kids, I tend to use a color scale of like symptoms being green, yellow, or red. What I do for kids is sort of relate it back to how well they're functioning in something is based on the color that they would choose. So let's use headaches for an example, because headaches are probably one of the most common symptoms after injury and recur in the school environment for a lot. So what I'll say to a kid is, let's say you're in the classroom and you have a headache, but it's not impacting your ability to do anything in that moment. You can still do math class just as well. You're following along with the teacher quite well. You can do your work. It's basically annoying or a nuisance that you have a headache at the same time. Those ones we call green. And then we say those ones we can continue with. So it's okay. Continue with what you're doing and just sort of monitor. But there's no need to change up the plan. You're performing just as well as you would normally would. And you're comfortable where you are. Um, Yellow symptoms, we say. I am in the classroom, I'm in math class, I have a headache, but it's definitely impacting my ability to do things. So I can stay in this classroom, that's okay, but I'm getting a little lost on what the teacher is saying. It's taking me longer than usual to do my work. I feel distracted, I feel irritable. Yellow are the ones that we say, we gotta change up what we're doing in some way. So maybe you need to have a paper handout instead of looking at the smart board, for example. Um, maybe what you're doing, you need to take more breaks. You've been doing it for too long. So sort of revisit what you're doing and change it up. Doesn't necessarily mean take a break from the environment, but some way you need to be accommodated to help you perform in that activity a bit better. And then we say red symptoms are the ones that are so bad we have to leave the environment. And those are the ones that we encourage kids to have quiet spaces or places within the school to accommodate their symptoms. So it's kind of teaching kids and everyone around them that we can't leave an activity or stop an activity every time we're in the green. It'll be really hard to progress over time and improve our recovery. So that's kind of what we mean by not having a symptom-free expectation or treating all symptoms as the same. How much your symptoms impact your performance should then relate to how much we accommodate for them in that moment. So that's what we like to think of for return to school. And that can apply to everything like test writing, homework afterwards, how much we need to accommodate, what's okay, and when we need to break. So that's what we want to move more towards. Um, The other thing, too, that is a common myth I see in schools often is that kids need to completely fully return to all aspects of school before they do any physical activity. It is true that kids should be fully back to school schedule and workload before they're back in competition or game or the final stages of return to sport. But if we limit all opportunities for safe physical activity within the school environment, we might be taking away those kids' tools to perform well in cognitive activities. So I have a lot of kids that need to burn off some steam at recess or need to do something to move their body to focus better or to be able to tolerate the classroom a little bit more because we know exercise is going to help their recovery. So we encourage schools and we also encourage the clients and families we work with to find what is that safe amount of physical activity within the school environment you're comfortable with. And usually it means some type of engagement in exercise at recess with their friends maybe not participating in that full 
soccer game with their friends at recess, but finding something for them that at least gets them out and being a bit active, being as active as they can outside of the school. And then phys ed is always one of those things that kind of depends on what the kid is doing. So sometimes phys ed is actually fitness-based activities at the time, and it'd be very appropriate for a kid to be doing those types of things. But then obviously it's not appropriate for a kid still in recovery to be doing like dodgeball, basketball, or volleyball or something like that. So we always just sort of decide what is it that you're doing within school and what's the right amount of physical activity for you? Because when we limit all aspects of physical activity or what I often see too, is keep a kid indoors for recess. Um, we might be creating more problems by doing that. And when we have increased irritability, sadness from that isolation, um, just a lack of ability to be active, it's hard to know where the symptoms are coming from anymore as, as that goes on. So I think that's one of the other myths we really, they want to get out there. Um, a few others that are common as well is I constantly see the way uh, we accommodate concussion tends to focus on the environment in the school, which, you know, is good in nature. So um, a quiet space, for example, maybe the kid would wear sunglasses or a noise canceling headphone or paper handouts. Those are helpful. But honestly, what I find more helpful for kids is accommodating the workload. And I find the workload often gets missed or is completely delayed until they feel better. The number one thing I see that can help kids recover from a concussion faster and just do better in the long term is if we put fast acting accommodations in place, which eliminates the non-essential workload they missed. So if they missed a week or two of school or they have missed a couple tests, they're not expected to get caught up on every single one. That is, I think, the number one thing that keeps kids from progressing and increases a ton of stress in kids when it's not clearly communicated that they don't have to get caught up on all those things. And then if we just say, don't worry, none of those things matter until you feel better. Well, now the kid is seeing this massive pile of work that they don't think they ever want to get back to because yeah. it's too overwhelming to even think mm -hmm. about. So we tend to more say, let's cut the non-essential workload and how do we prioritize what's important that's missed? I usually recommend it's got to be something that's knowledge building in nature. So if you don't learn this material, it's going to be really hard to learn future content. And there are certain mm -hmm. subjects that just build more um, than other subjects. So usually what's most helpful is to have a contact person at school or someone who's going to look at all your workload and make those decisions and communicate with all your teachers because it can be really hard to decide what is the priority in a high school kid's workload. Um, and it's kind of unfair to expect a 14-year-old to advocate for themselves on what that should be. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's one of the more common myths. And then the last one I'll just say is um, a lot of protocols in Return to Learn right now still have a lot of yes or no rules. Um, which encourage avoidance of certain activities, which if you kind of remember what I said from the beginning around not having symptom-free expectations, we kind of want to move away from that. So screens, for example, if screens aren't bothering a kid or they stay within the green, sometimes yellow level with their symptoms, we don't need to completely avoid them. We need to gradually start exposures with those tests. We don't want to have no rules around tests because again, if we delay all tests to a certain stage, we're going to prolong the recovery. So what can they start to pick up and work on? Um, the strong no rule we do need to follow is, again, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but I'll say it again, is the stuff that puts you at risk for another concussion. Those are the things that are a strong no rule. So like phys ed, sport participation, until a child is fully recovered. Everything else should be a little bit looser in terms of individualized based on what the kid is coping with well and what isn't. Otherwise, we might create rules for no reason and actually perpetuate more avoidance in activities that would actually help the kid recover in time. Um, so I think just to reiterate, it's that symptom-free expectation, quicker engagement in physical activity, actually accommodating the workload, not just the environment, and moving away from these strict no rules are the common myths or, I guess, things that have really good intentions, but actually create longer recovering kids we see very often still in schools. 
Thompson Rogers has been delivering results since 1935 and has evolved into one of the largest personal injury law firms in Ontario. Their personal injury lawyers fight to receive the compensation, support, and care you deserve, from car accidents to bike accidents, from slips and falls to medical malpractice. If you suffered any type of significant trauma, Thompson Rogers is there to help. Visit www.trlaw.com to learn more about the services they provide. Kind of building off your last point, um, I just want to ask you if there's a way for teachers to kind of identify what a student can and can't do academically while they're going through that process and understanding it's an individualized uh, kind of process for the student and the teacher. How would uh, you respond to that? Um, yeah, it's it's hard. I can give some ideas, but it really does depend on the student. I would really lean towards understanding the kid's circumstance of what the most important work that needs to get done is. We always encourage attendance first. So getting a kid back to the school environment is important before we start to put some workload on them, but we shouldn't wait for a complete full school return before doing any workload either. Like we slowly have to build kids self-efficacy and self-confidence by checking things off their to-do list to make them feel like they're progressing. That's really important for improving Mm -hmm. recovery as well. So usually what we tend to say is like, what is, what does this kid need to accomplish within within the next one to two months for school? What are the biggest priorities? That's where we should focus and do whatever we can to get that work done. So even if the kid, so I'll give some examples. Um, The kid's attending school well, but is having a lot of issues with workload. So it's not really the environment that's an issue. They're just really stuck in the work. Some really helpful accommodations might be, look, it's really tough to study online for a biology test when you're not at your best. Can we do an open book here? Can we do an assignment based? Let's focus more on learning instead of outputs. So what actually helps someone learn the content, not necessarily memorize it. Um, if someone's having issues with retention or just can't tolerate long work periods, it's, it's diff schools enough, let alone dumping two to three hours of homework after school in order for them to perform the next day. So we tend to say, you know, just do whatever we can that helps this kid learn the concepts in the meantime. Some of the other things to, to look for, and I feel this would resonate with teachers is we, there are a lot of kids right now that are very stressed about performing really well in school. Um, And I actually find those are the ones that tend to struggle a little bit with concussion recovery. And there's very high expectations they have on themselves and starting something when they don't feel at their best can kind of create this fear of failure. So if you have a kid who you know places a really strong sense of identity in their grades, it might be helpful to remove some of the grading expectations initially to allow them to slowly jump in. So um, we just want you to slowly learn this content, but throw it in the recycling after you're done. I'm not going to look at it. So there's sort of this, when they first try, there's not this fear of that others will think that they're dumb. I think this is a very common fear that a lot of people have because they don't feel at their best. So if I'm not hundred percent, I don't want to try but we want to encourage, you know, trying when not at your best, but not fear of repercussions for that. As the confidence builds, how can we slowly put some grading expectations in with kids and have a plan B? I think a lot of kids benefit from, if this test comes out completely outside of your usual self, we'll give you opportunities for a makeup. Like even that relief in itself can help kids Mm -hmm. build their confidence to jump in. So those are just a few examples of like things you can look for in the type of individual a kid is and how you would accommodate. Um, some kids uh, are going to need a little bit more of a scaling back approach. So you're doing a lot. You're sort of trying to do everything. You need more strategies on how to prioritize and like permission to use their accommodations. And some kids are going to need more of like an engaging approach. Like, like I just said, like exposures to things and encouraging them to try and just deciding what approach would work better for the kid that you know is likely to help their recovery. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think those are just a few things that people can look for, but it's so, like you said, it's highly individualized, but those are a few examples. 
I think those are really great points. And definitely the emphasis on learning opposed to the outputs, I think is really, really helpful. And I hope some teachers can uh, understand the value in that for sure. I know they would. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess kind of still talking about the same uh, kind of area within this experience, but how would you address the concern of a student not being able to complete the minimum requirements needed to pass a concussion? So kind of touch upon some ways that teachers can kind of work with the student, but what if it gets to that point where they actually may not meet the minimum requirements uh, or minimum achievement necessary to kind of pass that course? How does that work? Yeah, we get a lot of questions about this. And I want to start off by saying When we take more active approaches initially and we accommodate kids quickly, we encourage them to be back in the school environment as soon as possible. We focus on learning rather than outputs and we put some accommodations in place that allow kids to complete work to allow them to be graded. We actually shouldn't see this problem happen too often where kids are really behind in a course and have not completed the necessary requirements and we don't know where to go from there. To be honest, I find it's strict, rigid, you need to be symptom-free before you do anything that kind of creates this issue. So if we're a little bit more proactive with some of the stuff we've all talked about, we might prevent some of these occurrences from happening in the first place. But that being said, we can do all of these things and every now and then these things will still happen. I think a few examples I can think of is I've worked with quite a few kids who before their concussion, they were behind for whatever reason. Um, So this was just, you know, just one more thing in this kid's life that sort of set things back. And really at this point, it would be accommodating however you've done it for any other issue where a kid is really behind and you would problem solve what would work for that kid. So are we at a point where dropping this course and doing it this summer is better for this kid's well-being? Um, are, is this course even a kid's priority for the future goals that they want to do? I often find that's a big piece is it's like, I was just doing this credit. It actually isn't that important. So it's an easier decision. For the ones that are a priority, I just encourage it to do, to be used exactly the same way it is whenever there's large absences or missed work for any other issue. The same strategy applies to concussion as it would for someone who missed a lot for another injury or illness or maybe a family issue or maybe have mental health reasons. It's the same type of strategies on what does this kid want to be able to accomplish and how can we get them to their goals in the best way possible and, and what are all our options. Um, one thing I just want to touch on because it's been something I've been seeing a little bit since the pandemic is from a concussion perspective, it actually isn't a good idea to encourage virtual school for a catch-up plan or doing that instead of an in-person. Um, we learned a lot over the pandemic and the in-person piece, I think is extremely beneficial for concussion recovery. So I just wanted to put that out there that that's not something we would do to maybe support a kid in completing a course. Um, But if it's the only means then which it's offered, of course, whatever's going to work to get the kid what they need in the credit. But I think I just want to say is we shouldn't be seeing these circumstances too often. But the last thing I'll say is right now, it's also really unique. Like there are kids right now who between the pandemic strikes four years ago, literally never had a regular year of school. Um, And some kids just aren't ready for the next step as maybe some kids were previously because they lost key developmental like milestones and rites of passage that they should have had throughout their like older elementary or high school experiences. So maybe now more than ever, some people might be taking a few extra courses or taking an extra year before going off to post-secondary and that's okay. And we need to sort of communicate that that's okay. Um, I think we're in a bit of a unique circumstance, which we'll, I know we're gonna get into a bit more where a lot of kids aren't doing well before concussion. And then this happens and things get more complicated. So I think just for us all to realize that this has been a very challenging few years for kids and if they need if they need to delay a course or do it at another time, concussion or not, that's okay. 
and there's nothing wrong with taking that approach. So kind of like taking a step back, being able to assess the situation as a mm-hmm. whole would be quite beneficial as kind of what I'm hearing from you is understanding yeah. the mental health components too. Like that's, that's a big thing, especially with what we've been going through in the pandemic and everything. I guess what I'll just say is from my experience, I haven't seen too often kids needing to drop out of a course or delay a course for solely concussion reasons. There's usually more at play that the concussion has complicated. So it's important to take a step back and not sort of, you know, say the concussion has resulted in all of this. It's not usually the case when I've seen those, I guess, more uncommon examples where those decisions need to be made. There's a lot going on outside of that. Um, So it's really important to take a step back and look at that kid's life and just see where we go from there with their goals and what they want to do in the future with their learning in school. Yeah, I really like that. And just making sure teachers are there to support opposed to being there to be like, oh, we got to get this done. We got to get this done. It's it's kind of another theme I'm starting to notice is being there to ensure the kids are able to progress. And I know all teachers would want that from their students as well. So just making sure that we're always remembering that in the back of everything. Yeah, I think a lot of uh, teachers I've talked to over the past few years have really had to step up to be teachers of life rather Mm -hmm. than teachers of content and like hats off to teachers who have taken on this role because um it's very challenging and it's kind of shifted of what we even think of what schools do and I think over the past few years they've more been a system of care for kids than they have been a institute of teaching concepts um and it's important to recognize that role and that applies here as well and everything we're talking about yeah so i guess just kind of say like on the same topic here and you, we talked about the transition with covid to kind of virtual learning how it's not um necessarily conducive to a student who's sustained a concussion and maybe navigating through that um what factors impact teachers like when they're trying to navigate Um, a student who has a concussion in a virtual learning session um, and what complexities should they be considering? Um, I know we've touched upon the mental health and everything, but how can they be navigating those, the virtual environment and everything with COVID a little more? Yeah, I think over COVID, um, a lot of things were from a concussion perspective were made easier for kids from who had concussions, but a lot of things were made a lot harder. So there was kind of wins and losses. Um, I know a lot of schools are sort of moving away from the virtual environment, but the virtual environment still exists for many reasons or hybrid models. I know post-secondary education will probably be like that much more often moving forward than maybe high school and elementary school. Um, I mean, the the pros of a virtual environment, if again, I'm just going to say I always support an in-person environment for concussion recovery, but if virtual Mm -hmm. is the only option, these are some things that might work. So the nice thing about virtual is there is easier opportunity for breaks that are slightly less awkward for kids. It's quite awkward to get up and leave your classroom. Um, like just to acknowledge that. Yeah, like, it really is. I want to do that. Like it's awkward. Um, yeah. And it makes people uncomfortable. It's easier to do that in a virtual environment. You know, you turn your camera off and there's permission to do that or take a quick break, keep your headphones in. Those mini breaks, um, I guess, have less social awkwardness, which is nice and helps. Um, I do find obviously tons of screen time can be some challenging for a lot of people, but we give a lot of strategies for that around like there's like this 20, 20, 20 rule for eye breaks, um, using things that would actually support the right use of natural light with their screen in the room. And also where they can have paper handouts and just listen whenever possible. It's, it's pretty similar. Um, but again, it's important to engage in some type of screen time and then just find the chunks or the opportunities that can be paper-based and what absolutely has to be on the computer because it can be really it's some things are just impossible to do on paper like there's a lot of coding classes these days so Mm -hmm. you have to pick which ones have the opportunities to not be on screens to give those kids a bit of a break and I think we stick with those but it's okay for the ones that have to be we just give them the tools to tolerate it better in time um but the reality is for the virtual environment especially for kids who have focus issues prior to injury 
can be a lot more challenging to learn content, um, stay focused. And I often feel in a virtual environment, sometimes there's a higher expectation of self-directed learning, which is really challenging to do when you're not feeling at your best. So the other thing I would say is sometimes in a virtual environment, kids might need more opportunities for like one-on-one learning and actually teaching to engage a bit um, rather than here's a general idea of the concept. Now go take it and learn it on your own for one to two hours. So I sometimes try and like, obviously self-directed learning is very important and we should all have that skill set. but in concussion recovery, it's a little bit harder to do. And sometimes you need someone to sort of sit through you and actually teach you the concepts, um, in a more detailed way that the virtual environment doesn't always provide because there's that less opportunity for drop-in or just talking to someone that you don't understand something on your way in or out of class. So if teachers can kind of make sure that they're available or there's a clear process that isn't completely on the kid initiating that they need help. Because a lot of kids won't initiate. It's 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 hard mm-hmm. to initiate. It's challenging. And we can say, oh, advocate, be more independent. But you know, you're <laughs> when you're when you're younger, it's just really hard to do that. So we might need to create um those opportunities to allow those conversations to come up that actually initiate from the adult and then give the the child or student the opportunity to bring it forward. So those are just some things from the virtual environment I've been seeing. We may need to up a little bit more yeah. when we're working with kids in recovery. No, I think that actually leads perfectly into my next question here is uh, what can students be doing to accelerate their recovery process and where can teachers help with this process? So you touch upon the virtual, the in-person. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. One of the things I find, what I work on for the kids to do or the clients on themselves is a little bit more of an understanding about how mood impacts their cognitive functioning. I often feel it's the stress, it's the uncertainty, it's the lack of confidence, the decreased self-efficacy, which is complicating the focus, the memory, the the cognitive issues that we, we see. So I tend to work with kids on strategies on understanding the connection between mood, stress, well-being, and how well they can perform at the things they want to do cognitively. Um, there's like stress behaviors, for example, that a lot of kids do that they might heighten in concussion recovery. So a lot of kids might have a higher tendency to avoid activities that are stressing them out. So we'll go through what I call like a fear hierarchy. So we don't want to start with the task that's nine out of 10 stressful for us to start because it's just going to bring up all these feelings about what we don't know. Um, but we got to get there eventually. So what on the hierarchy can we start with? But then teachers need to support and sort of prioritizing so they're not wasting their time on work that's just not relevant or important and using their cognitive efforts, not strategically. So it's like, teachers tell us what's important, create a minimum list, and then we'll work to sort of understand how stress and mood is connected with, with going through those tasks. So that's just like one example. Um, I also find a lot of kids do... Um, a lot of other types of stress behaviors when they're in recovery, which may take a little bit longer for their work. So a lot of kids start to check their work way more often than they would normally would. And I think it's because they're uncertain Um, and therefore it's taking them a really long time. Like I have some kids who would check work maybe 12 to 13 times after they do it, or they seek a lot more reassurance from people. Like, am I doing this right? Is this due date right? and are most sort of leaning on their own understanding and strengths and relying on other people to really, to um, relieve their worries. So these are sort of a few themes of some things that I work up with kids and other, and then other times it's just creating a schedule for cognitive participation success. So some kids benefit a lot from doing a little bit of exercise before they do cognitive activity. Some kids need a whole like reawakening of their sleep hygiene. Like that's really impacting their yeah. ability to um, perform well in school. Um, you know, there's a lot of focus just used, but I'm like, your sleep schedule is all over the map. So it's kind of to be expected or 
we have some kids who are just trying to cram everything into their schedule still and haven't really picked the priorities that they need to do. So I think the other thing I work on with kids is what time of day is cognitive activity going to be very successful for you? Um, what else is going on in your life that's complicating the picture and making sure their demands and resources match because sometimes they are way more demands than they're currently able to do with the time. So it's not avoiding things necessarily because I never want to fall into a theme of completely avoiding things, but it's just what's important to you in your life right now and what can maybe go or what can we maybe hand off for someone else to do at this time. A lot of kids I work with too are a part of like 15 committees and like a lot of like different extracurricular activities and they still want to do all of it and they will, they'll get back back to all of it. But for a time period, um, sometimes it can create a lot of noise in our minds and it's, it's hard to focus because we, we are so overwhelmed by all the things we do that that's actually creating a bit of distraction, in our ability to focus on our school efforts. So maybe that gives you a few examples of what we work on at a individual level with the kids um, and sort of like what they take on to support their recovery. Um, but it's only as helpful as the accommodations that they have and the priorities that are helped set for them in their workload. Otherwise, they are taking on a part-time job, talking to each teacher, asking yeah. what the priorities are mm-hmm. and um, it gets more complicated. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I'm I'm starting to see even more similarities between like just setting priorities, whether it be from a teacher's perspective, a student's perspective, yeah. maybe even a parent's perspective, but being able to set those priorities, understand what is most important in this recovery for you to be doing. As you mentioned, such busy schedules for students, right? They have so many things on the yeah. go and including their social lives as well. So um, just navigating through it. Um, can be a challenge for sure. So I guess- I'm sorry, I'm just going to add one more thing just based on what you just said. I think it's important to highlight and it's that I think a lot of kids fall in, especially when they're behind in school and recovery, they fall into this pattern of feeling guilty whenever they're not doing school stuff. And it's, it's really important to remember that like exercise and social activity and the right amount of sleep is as important as school functioning. Um, and helping people understand that those things are as important in their life in recovery um, takes a bit of time. So sometimes when we're setting priorities, everyone's priorities are going to be a little bit different. But I think it's really important that we all agree when it comes to kids, concussion or not, they should have some type of meaning or priority outside of school. Mm-hmm. And if they don't, um, that's a problem right? Like that's a problem. So I think that's the one thing I'm, uh, another thing I find that I have to work with is almost giving kids permission to say, it's okay to take 30 minutes for social activity. You don't need to feel guilty that you're not studying. So sort of that theme of work smart, not hard. (laughs) That makes sense, but that takes a lot of maturity and time to discover we all went through it, right? We do it in our own Mm -hmm work days every day as adults where we revisit what we're doing and am I being productive in this time? Would I be more productive if I took a bit of time for myself and then tried this thing? But kids are learning that. And that's, especially when they're teenage years, they're just starting to learn that skill set. But concussion can really make you completely dive into a school, like tunnel focus and think nothing else matters. Um, So I think that's just the last piece. I think it's important what you said and that we need to help realize that other things in life are just as important. And you have an identity outside of being a really good student with good grades. You have more to offer to the world um, and remind yourself of that in your strengths and other areas of your life by living your life in other areas. So, Well, well, I think what you're mentioning there really touches upon the mental health pieces as well, right? And how the concussion recovery is so intertwined with mental health and, and just how you're navigating through that. And most often like doing proper like mental health practices can actually help a student see progress in a concussion recovery as well. Yeah, I'll I'll touch on that a little bit because I think schools maybe now more than ever are overwhelmed with mental health needs um, of their students. And a lot of the strategies that work for anxiety, low mood, maybe um, learning issues that have a strong mood connection like ADHD, 
these strategies um, can work really well for kids with concussion as well. Like schools have the tools to do this. It's obviously a bit different in nature because you're dealing with a sudden change in someone that happens with an event rather than something that maybe has been diagnosed and more prolonged and existed before. So we just have to be more rapid in nature and how we react to it um, and be open-minded to the fact that unlike diagnoses that would carry through someone for years or lifetime, concussion will change very quickly and rapidly week by week. And we need to adjust very quickly to that. So kids progress and we should continue to make sure those accommodations make sense with their progression and not be fast acting in nature. So one thing that we're really learning um, that I don't think a lot of people understand is yes, yes, there's mental health challenges after concussion and there's lots of different theories as to why that might be. But what we're really learning now is that your pre-injury mental health, coping, stress, all the things that happen before injury are kind of where is sort of setting the stage, which might determine how likely you are to perhaps struggle with concussion should you sustain one. Um, so I like to explain, or this I explain it to um, the clients that we work with, is that mental health is your brain's immune system. It needs to be in a good state, um, mentally, in well-being, coping, stress. And if we add anything to it, like a concussion, maybe a stressful social situation, maybe complex family dynamics. We're not in a very good state to recover from those things that are suddenly added to the previous pressures that we already had. So sometimes what happens is we um, see that the mental health issues that were pre-injury are now just more complicated in nature as a result of the concussion. And the concussion experience itself, not just the injury, but the actual experience can sort of create a lot more of these mood issues. And there's a massive mind-body connection. I don't, I think a lot of people understand, yes, mental health can affect your emotions, but it can affect you physically and cognitively as well. It can completely affect your focus, your ability to remember. Poor mental health can give you more headaches, greater sensitivity to lighter noise. And these are all symptoms that cross over a lot mm -hmm. with concussions. So um, I guess my general rule of thumb here and why we need to take or reconsider our strict approaches that we take with concussion sometimes is if we're making accommodations or rules from a concussion perspective that are likely to decrease someone's mental health, we're not supporting their recovery. Um, so strict isolation, bedroom jail, avoiding school, these are things that we know in time will make mental health worse, which therefore can make their concussion recovery. Worse. So I think that's what we need to think of when we're working with kids is, will this also help their concussion and their well-being and their mental health? If we're only doing it for the sake of concussion, we might want to ask ourselves questions because it might, with really good intentions, do the opposite of what we wanted. So, yeah, yeah. I really, really, really like all of that. That's uh, mm -hmm. so important to understand. And I think the way you even put it where like, if you're prescribing certain things as a teacher to a student that is almost going to go against their mental health, it is just yeah. not going to be positive for their recovery. So just that simple thing to keep in mind can really go a long way for both a student and a teacher when supporting um, someone through this experience. But yeah, to change pace a little bit here, um, I, as I mentioned in the intro of the podcast, we did hear from teachers and get their experience um, with working with children uh, who have sustained a concussion and, and navigating it. So I do uh, want to read out a passage that we actually uh, were able to get from one of those teachers. And then I'd love to get your thoughts on it afterwards, Stephanie, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, this is again from a teacher. I work with children who have brain injuries and in brackets, not a concussion. So this isn't specific to a concussion, but I think there's some great learning points in here. My practice is to identify the different learning levels of the child through academic testing and task analysis. Once a cognitive level of a student has been identified, I will create an IEP to guide my teaching throughout the year. This document is ever-changing and allows for adjustment depending on success, success rates. 
These children are often accommodated in the classroom with various teaching, testing, and environmental accommodations. I'd love to get your thoughts on, on that kind of uh, treatment for a student. Yeah, I think it's a really nice um, statement because I love how right now there's not really a focus so much on symptoms, but just what can this student do? How can we support their learning? How can we make sure that our teaching supports their type of learning, testing, and our mental accommodations? I like it because it takes a step back. And I think that um, this is what we need to do with concussion a little bit more, um, is just look at the situation and decide what needs to be done. I do want to acknowledge though that the situation is quite different. So it's obviously a lot easier when we have formal IEPs in place. Um, and formal IEPs are not typically done for concussion. Think of concussion as more of like a temporary IEP that wouldn't formally go on a student's record and follow them through their school years. There's just temporary accommodations we put in place. So I think sometimes when there is a diagnosis where we can expect it to be more long-term in nature, like a moderate severe brain injury or ADHD or a learning disability, it's, it's a bit easier because there's very formal processes in place with an IEP that sort of support teachers and sort of, and they're not as quickly changing in nature. So just to appreciate that the, the situations can be very different in terms of the tools that teachers have available to them. What I like about the statement though, is just how, you know, I just work with the student's strengths. I work with the, what the student is struggling with. I sort of juggle all the strategies that I know might be available or have worked with people in the past or might work with this type of kid. And I base my testing and environmental and teaching accommodations around that. Um, it's just, a, it's a great approach. And I think it's something we should be doing more instead of, are you stage three or stage four? <laughs> These are activities that you should be doing and not be doing because um, it just works better. We know it works better. Um, so I think, but I just do want to acknowledge that, you know, teachers don't have many, as many supports when it doesn't fall under a formal IEP. They're sort of juggling a little bit there. Um, and, uh, yeah, and it's going to change quickly. So just when you get comfy with information, you're going to have to change it. So, um, yeah. outside of teachers, this is why we need learning support specialists. Maybe it's a guidance counselor. Maybe it's a nurse within the school. I'm not sure who, vice principals. There's a lot of people who sort of step into this role, but someone needs to be that, I guess, main contact person who coordinates with all the teachers and sort of supports them because it's challenging to do this just from a teacher perspective. There has to be some other support within the school system to support the level of individualization that I'm talking about and how quickly it would change. Um, it's just teachers have how many students to take care of with who, how many, how, how, like there's so many IEPs now, people are under-resourced. It's, it's very challenging. So there has to be some other support within the school system to meet the approach that you just discussed from a concussion standpoint. Yeah, and another question, a direct question from one of the teachers, which builds off this actually quite well, is when working with children with special needs, I create an IEP that informs my teaching, as we, we just saw there. Is there a framework to follow for teachers who have a child with a concussion? Yeah, so I think the best frameworks we have is like these protocols, which may or may not align with some of those individual needs. I guess what I would say is a lot of the frameworks that we use for anxiety, ADHD, those types of accommodations that help kids progressively become more active within their schooling and make reasonable like workload modifications are your frameworks and tools which already exist, which are likely to support really well. We just have to be more rapid access in how we put them in place. You're going to get less direction from the medical community on them because there isn't sort of as much formality to it. Um, and we have to be willing and flexible to change them week by week. Um, yeah. The frameworks are there um, and they exist. And I think a lot of concussion protocols can support this as long as you're just sort of look at your protocol and say, is there a lot of no words in my protocol? Is there symptom-free expectations? Those are the ones we want to loosen a bit and more lean towards the ideas of the accommodations that the protocols present. 
Thank you so much for answering that question. I do think it is very helpful and it is a, a kind of a pressing question, the framework, of course, for them to follow as we've touched upon at many points in this podcast. Um, I guess one thing, a question I do have for you, as we know, teachers are like amazing at uh, helping students learn and progress in their lives. How can they leverage their existing understanding of their students' needs and the skill set they already have to just kind of help students through this process and in the accommodations that they can provide? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. And I think it um, touches on a few things we've talked about already, but I truly believe teachers know kids' pre-injury functioning, their learning style, um, what makes them tick um, better than anybody. Um, when I meet someone in the medical community, I'm only meeting them in a short period of time. I gather a lot of clinical history the best that I can, as well as a functional history, but truly teachers know these kids best and they're kind of experts in these kids. So yes, there's expertise in concussion. What often gets forget or what's so important when we're talking about brains and people is who is the expert in this person? Obviously the client themselves, their parents and the people around them who have been heavily involved, which is teachers and sometimes even coaches, depending on how often you would be working with that kid. So I think it's really getting back to just what does this kid need? What works for them and what sets them on a plan that reaches their goals? And if we start to focus more in that way and be a little bit more solution focused in that approach rather than problem and symptom focused, uh, we will be doing so much better in terms of getting kids on the right path quicker and better after a concussion injury. Um, I, I think the other thing that I often see is when we become problem focused. So did you get symptoms? Did you not? <laughs> what are your issues? Um, it's, it's slowly taking away that kid's confidence and nobody is better sometimes than a teacher or a school environment to build that confidence back again. So I think just in summary, it's, you're, you have a lot of expertise in these kids. Just think of what you would do to help this kid in their well-being and you know what works them and what's going to motivate them. Um, what do they actually, what are their goals in their learning? Like, what do they need to accomplish this year? What, what do they need to head towards? And that can sort of guide your priorities. And be a little bit more solution focused, or I guess also um, acknowledging progress. In, in kids rather than um, problems or what they still have left to do. I think those are just some final statements on what we can rethink with this population and um, what I find actually helps kids get better. Yeah, I think those are some really great closing points there. And um, just, yeah. Just being able to leverage their existing skill set, their existing knowledge of the student is so important. And, and it can be forgotten. That's, that's kind of the weird thing with concussion. So just a gentle reminder that teachers, you are amazing. Just use your skill set and just keep uh, doing what you can to support the students. Um, with that, I would love to just open it up to you if you have anything you'd like to share, Stephanie, uh, before we close things out here. Yeah, no, this has been great. I think... My final statement is just to acknowledge again the past two years that we've been through <laughs> in schools and with kids and why now more than ever, it's so important to change our approach with kids with concussion. I think we did a not so great international experiment where um, we saw what happened when kids were out of school for long periods of time didn't have sport, didn't have social interaction. It's pretty much like a bedroom jail approach to concussion that we used to do. And look how many net new problems were created. I mean, obviously all these things were necessary at the time. This is what we had to do. It was a global pandemic, but we also learned a lot about what it meant for kids' well-being and how important things like school and meaningful daily activities are to kids well-being and when we take those things away we don't help kids um and i think that's just a really good lesson to take forward on why we need to, because 
we need to change our approach now more than ever. We're we're really understanding that what we did in the past probably didn't help so much. And the last piece is that we do have a lot of kids who aren't doing as well pre-injury. And therefore, we can expect them to maybe need a little bit more support after an injury because there's more going on that's complicating the picture. And taking a step back and appreciating that this is not just a kid with a concussion. This is a kid who got a concussion and maybe also B, C, and D, like in addition. So therefore, are we, we have to make sure we're supporting those other things because the mind and the brain and your emotions, it's all in one place. Um, and if we don't support just helping people feel good about life, having meaning to get up in the morning, um, having things that they feel good at and are skilled at, have things to participate in, it's no wonder that they're they continue to have symptoms um, as they start to have different sources and where they're created outside of the injury, which are those non-injury factors, which is, I don't have anywhere to go. I don't exercise. I don't have a purpose when I go to school. I don't have expectations, um, those types of things. So I think I, it's just a really good time to do a bit of a reset um, and, and what we know about kids and take a whole different approach and really understanding um, schools are about getting kids back to life and that is, or sorry, getting kids through life. And that's what concussion should be too, is getting kids back to life and participating wherever they possibly can. And when we do that, we can expect really good outcomes for kids with concussion. So it's kind of a nice, I guess, positive note is <laughs> when we take these more active approaches, we won't be seeing as much of the prolonged issues that we have seen concussion in the past so it it's actually hopeful for the future as well well thank you stephanie so much we really appreciate this and you taking the time out of your day to kind of inform us on these amazing topics and and the conversation you were able to provide was just yeah exceptional and uh yeah lots of passion too i love your passion for the topic and <laughs> Thank you. and just being able to uh actually have so many actionable things that teachers can do uh in order to of course accommodate a concussion in the classroom so i know any parent teacher school administrators even students can actually listen to this podcast and take so much valuable information from it so i really appreciate you uh being able to help us facilitate this thank you so much Yeah, glad it was helpful and thank you so much for having me.